to Christ community and happy Father's Day to all the fathers. So many words to describe you. I can't say them all. But to all you dads out there, hopefully we came close. Hopefully you're feeling our love, feeling God's love to you. Happy Father's Day. We are so proud of you. And this is a wonderful day that we celebrate our father that gives us direction and identity for who we are as fathers. And so we surely celebrate you today. We got a great worship in store today. God's got a great word in worship for us today. I can't wait to jump into this Father's Day worship today. Oh, man, it's going to be off the chain. But before we do that, you know how we do at Christ Community. We got to share some love, wish some happy Father's Day to your brothers, your sisters there in the browser, on Facebook, on YouTube. Come on and do that right now. Welcome somebody. I know you haven't talked to anybody all week. Come on and share some love. Let's demonstrate the community, but let's also lift up our wonderful fathers. We are so proud of you and so glad to have you share with us on this Lord's Day. The Lord is good. On this day, we also are going to share in the Lord's Supper. That's the ordinance he left for us to remember him by, to experience his presence. And so if you haven't had a chance, go ahead and get all your elements, get your crackers, get your bread, get your juices, get all that you need. And, and let's go ahead and prepare as we will be doing the Lord's Supper in just a few moments. I'm going to give you a few moments to get all that together, and we will do that together. I just got a couple of things I want to share with you. Uh, uh, number one, you're going to be getting that reopening video real soon. Um, just wanted to make sure we do it right. We, it took quite a bit of work, and I know I mentioned it a couple of Sundays ago. We're about ready to release that. We want to make sure it's done in a professional way, in an excellent way, but also in a way that blesses and connects with you. We're going to be sharing that. You should be getting an email on that very, very soon and kind of let you know what Christ Community has been praying and working on in terms of what reopening looks like for us. Amen. And then also, too, I, I just wanted to um, make sure you're being connected uh, with our care team. We're reaching out to you. want to make sure you feel connected with us, and we definitely want you to uh, remain connected with the body of Christ at Christ Community, also reaching beyond that as we continue to make a difference. Again, happy Father's Day to all the fathers, uh, as this is going to be a great, great worship uh, and a move of God in our midst today. And so hopefully you've got a chance to get all of your elements as we go ahead and prepare for the Lord's Supper. Uh, go ahead and gather all that. I'm going to read a scripture in your hearing. Uh, just to celebrate and encourage fathers, encourage all of us uh, during this crisis time. We are still in a bit of a crisis, but God is still on the throne. Hopefully things are going well for you, but I believe there's an encouragement as we share in the Lord's Supper. He left us two ordinances to practice, the ordinance of baptism and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And this is a time when we come together. Not only do we celebrate the gospel, Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, but we celebrate that one day he will come back. And when he comes back, all this crisis, all this mess, all this suffering, all the pain that we see, it will be no more. And so in the meantime, the Lord suffers our opportunity to connect with the Lord and be encouraged in times like these. And so hopefully you had a chance to get your elements. I got a scripture I want to read in your hearing today. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse Two and three and four, two through four. And here's how it reads. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And that's what the insurance we have uh, for fathers, for families, for mothers, for all of us, for people of faith, no matter where, what you're going through, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, no matter where we are, no matter what the crisis, we can rest in God's comfort. That's what we're going to do here. We're going we're gonna to share in the Lord's Supper, but I want us to be reminded that in all that we go through and all the challenges in life, all the difficulties, fathers, all that you're carrying, all that people don't understand, mothers, all that you're going through, for all of us, it can be difficult. And we may get this one respite today as fathers, 
But in the midst of that, please know, please know, we serve a God who's the God of all comfort. He's the paraclete. He walks with us. He's our counselor. He supports us. And my prayer is as we take the Lord's Supper at this time, more than anything, you would experience the power and the presence of the paraclete in your life to know that in the midst of the crisis, God is working on us. He's giving us the power and the victory to conquer whatever challenge we might have. And we can be encouraged that he's still on the throne. And so hopefully you got your elements. Hopefully that scripture encourages you. Keep that uh, for your week. And I hope that will bless you and keep you. So let's go ahead and bless the Lord with a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper. Father, we thank you again for this time and this day that you have made, this wonderful morning you've given to us as we prepare our hearts to take your supper that you left for us. And it surely gives us the hope, not only that we have eternal life because of what you accomplished on the cross, not only because we have abundant life in this life for what you have demonstrated on the cross, but also too, Lord, that in the midst of all that we go through, we have your comfort. We have the presence of the paraclete who lives in our hearts, who leads us and guides us. There's somebody watching right now, Lord, this has been a very difficult week. There's some father that's watching. Though it's Father's Day, he's got his own challenges as a father. And there are many families that are watching today, Lord, that need your comfort. Would you, would you allow your spirit to rest upon us today? Let us experience your joy. Let us experience your comfort. Let us experience your peace to know, God, that you are on our side. And nothing that comes against, against us can deter us from your perfect purposes for our lives. We love you. We bless you. We thank you. Join us as we share in this Lord's Supper for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So hopefully you got your elements. I have the, the traditional elements. This wafer represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us 2,000 years ago, shed his blood that we might have life. If you have it, let's lift it up and let us eat together. This cup is juice, and it's a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us 2,000 years ago, that he may pay the penalty for us so that we might have relationship with him and receive the comfort, the paraclete, that we need in times like these. Let us drink together as we drink. Let us pause and allow God's spirit to speak to our hearts, and let us be thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. And I hope God's comfort and his spirit will be with you in this coming week. And this week will be much better than whatever you've been through this past week. Thank you so much for the offering and the gifts that you've been giving so consistently. And this is a, the opportunity. We just pause for a moment to let you know there are many ways you can continue to support this ministry. And we are continuing to do in ministry. A lot of things are going on in Christ's community. More importantly, we're really trying to prepare for an opening. We don't want to be premature, and you'll get all that information in the video that's coming. Uh, but all that is toward making sure we can continue to do ministry. Continue to pray for us as more opportunities come available to do ministry, whether in the political realm, even in the medical realm, possible testing site, those kinds of opportunities. So be in prayer. Your support helps us do that. And more importantly, I believe God is blessing y'all anyway because you're faithful to him. And watch this, he'll be faithful to you. And so let's go ahead and bless that. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of giving. Bless us, use it for your glory, honor your name in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've talked way too much. We got to hear the best praise team on the planet. I'm ready to lift him up on this Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to our eternal Father. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Let's go ahead and worship our Father and be encouraged for what he has for us today. We want to say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. We're so grateful for you. We would be nothing without you, but we would be nothing without our Heavenly Father. So this morning we say you're a good, good Father, and we thank you. We bless your name. Oh, we bless your name. Yeah. 
You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are.
bless your name. over us all, God, with everything that's going on, God, you kept COVID-19 from our dwelling, God, and we bless your name, God, we bless your name, God, you're keeping us healthy, God, I know people taking all kinds of herbs, but God, you are. Father, we bless you and just thank you again for the opportunity to share in your spirit, and we surely need you in this time. We thank you for all the fathers. Uh, that are watching today and in creation. And we know as a father, you care about our fathers. Our fathers are hurting. Our fathers have challenges, Lord. But our fathers have been incredible soldiers. And so we're thankful for the fathers today. So, Lord, help us to celebrate our fathers today, to know, God, that you know the challenges and the pressures, pressures and the stresses that come with fatherhood, but that you're a good, good father that is able to help our fathers be the best they can be. So bless us now, Lord, as you share with us, and we surely will give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to lift up the, the fathers today, and we sure had a chance during Mother's Day to lift up the moms, and we love you moms, but fathers also need encouragement too, and I know you understand that, and I hope you're celebrating the fathers of your children and the fathers in your life. All of us, I hope we're celebrating fathers, father figures, whatever father you have, I pray that you're celebrating them in, the spe in a very special and best way. And so I want to lift up a word from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. A couple of these scriptures kind of capture the relationship of the Apostle Paul with his son in the ministry by the name of Timothy. There's this father-son relationship that I want to lift up, that though it was a, a ministerial relationship, there's some principles and some encouragement for all of us as to how we ought to be fathers and we can be encouraged as fathers uh, in this day. First, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 reads like this, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. And then 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes that letter while he's on death row, probably his last letter. He says this, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And I want to talk about big shoulders. I want to talk about big shoulders, big shoulders. I don't know about you, but in all the stuff that we've been going through, I think I'm having a little bit of crisis fatigue. <laughs> That's what I'm kind of going through. I mean, COVID-19, COVID-45, <laughs> um, all the politics, uh, another murder with all the murders we've already seen, George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and now Rashad Brooks. With all the stuff we're seeing, all the, the, the conflict, the economic downturn, the unemployment, and all the stuff that you are even doing in your sheltered-in-place existence. I don't know about you, but I'm getting a little bit of crisis fatigue. Matter of fact, just last week, we celebrated the graduation of our 2020 graduates, 
And I feel like I've gone through my own graduation. I've graduated from cabin fever to crisis fatigue. Is there anybody that's watching that knows what I'm talking about? I mean, if I get another bad news story, I'm about to scream because crisis fatigue is for real. But in the midst of all this crisis fatigue, church, I, I saw something twice, actually two times. I saw two photos that really blessed my heart. And it was kind of like God was sharing with me that, Archery, it's good to have a focus on the cause, but don't forget what is important. It's like God was reminding me as a father what my primary responsibility was. And on your screen, there are two wonderful pictures that in the midst of the protest, I saw two fathers as they protested who had their children on their shoulders. And that just spoke volumes to me. On the one hand, I, I, I heard the voices of these fathers. Matter of fact, one father there, he's on a megaphone and he's actually one of the main speakers at the protest, but he's not so involved in the call that he doesn't have his son sitting on his shoulders. And I, I, I heard his voice, but at the same time, I also felt his heart. Here was a father who had some big shoulders. And that's what I just kind of want to lift up today as we celebrate the fathers. We, we are who we are as men. We are who we are as daughters, as women and men of God, as children. We are who we are because God has given us fathers with big shoulders. And to you dads, we say thank you today. Thank you for, your big, for the big shoulders that you provided for us. And I want to encourage all of you, if you know you had that father in your life, don't forget to celebrate him. I sure am thankful for my own father and the big shoulders he provided for me. And so this is a moment we pause and we say thank you for our fathers and the big shoulders they lent to us that we can rest in them. And, and I'm really thankful because I already know many fathers who are watching me now, you're already carrying so much weight, but in spite of all the weight on your shoulders, you didn't shift the weight in such a way where we were on the margin of your shoulders. We stayed at the center of your shoulders. All the challenges of being the breadwinner in your family, all the hard work that comes with marriage or relationship or all the hard work in dealing with the mother of your children, in spite of all the weight that has been thrown on your shoulder, you, you didn't shift the shoulder in such a, the weight in such a way that would shift us off the center of your shoulders, but you kept us at the center. And to you, we say thank you. Thank you for keeping us at the center of your shoulders, your good fathers. Matter of fact, there was a 2015 study that said that this generation of fathers are probably the most involved fathers when it comes to fathering children today than any of the previous generations. That includes my generation. That includes my wonderful father's generation. Out of all the generations, your generation right now is probably one of the best fathering generations. Doesn't mean that previous generations were bad. It just means that you have borne the weight. And I got to give a plug, plug to my brothers, black African-American fathers. At the top of the list are African-American fathers that you're most likely to be involved in the lives of your children. Because many times there's a false narrative out there that would try to suggest that somehow African-American fathers don't care about their children. That's a lie, but I'm here to celebrate you and let you know we're proud of you. I know it's been difficult, but we're proud of you. I know sometimes you and mom don't see eye to eye, but we're proud of you. And God is proud of you because you've lent your big shoulders and you've kept the children at the center of your big shoulders. But I can hear some of y'all already saying, well, my father's shoulders were just not that big. Matter of fact, they were kind of small. And if the truth be told, Father's Day for you is a little bit tough. Just like Mother's Day is a little bit tough for some, Father's Day for you is a little bit difficult. Matter of fact, I saw a post recently that said, my dad taught me everything except how to live without him. For some of you watching today, Father's Day is a little bit tough. When I think of Father's Day, sometimes we had a father that was like that old temptation song, Papa was a rolling stone. And for some of you, 
Papa was more of a rolling stone and maybe he was more of a stubborn stone in that he really didn't give you the validation and the support and the affirmation that you needed when you were growing up. And so for you, Father's Day is a little bit tough. And then some of you, maybe dad wasn't a rolling stone, maybe dad wasn't a stubborn stone, but for some of you, let's be real, let's be honest, he was an absent stone. Truth is, for whatever reason, he was not there for you. You needed him, and you feel that void in your life, and it's real. And so for you, Father's Day is a little bit tough because truth is, the father's womb is real. That rejection is real. And many times on days like these in which we want to celebrate, it only irritates the father wound on the inside. And so some of you, some of you, you probably feeling like, what that young man felt in Denzel's movie, Equalizer 2, who didn't have a father in his life, but Denzel came in his life and was trying to be a father figure to him as a young African-American man, and he stepped in to try to help him to keep, from, to keep him from going down the bad, the wrong road. But if you remember in the movie, the antagonist, uh, Denzel was also a father figure for him, and he also didn't have the presence of Denzel, and he was angry about it. And because of his anger, he ended up getting into some stuff he had no business getting into. He went down a road of destruction that eventually took his life. And maybe you identify with today what it feels like not to have a father. Maybe black, in, black, in Black Panther, you more identify with Killmonger than you do with T'Challa. That even though both of them lost their fathers, the way that Killmonger had to live life without his dad, he was fueled with anger and frustration. And so for many of you, Father's Day is a little bit difficult. And you'll wonder, are there big shoulders for you? And yet some of us who are watching, you're saying, oh, that's true, Pastor. But then again, for me, <laughs> already carrying enough on my shoulders, and I don't even know how I'm making it. I don't feel like I have big shoulders because I'm carrying this, I'm carrying that, I'm dealing with stress, all that I'm seeing on TV and the protests and all that's going on, the expectations of what is put on me as a father. Sometimes I just want to scream because the truth is today as fathers, we're not expected to be fathers. We're expected to be super dads. We're expected to have a big OS on our chest. We're expected to, to leap tall buildings in a single bound. We're expected to be Iron Man and never hurt and cry. We're expected almost to be omnipresent, almost omnipotent. We're expected to be the ultimate provider. And that can be a lot of weight for any father to carry on his shoulders. Matter of fact, case in point, I'm going to plug here our brother Rashad Brooks who lost his life, I think what's being lost in all the conversation is that it was too much pressure on his shoulders. He was complying with the law. He did everything he was asked to do. He was patient. He was courteous. He was respectful. And yet somehow the, the, the stop took more than 40 minutes. Uh, uh, it was a textbook citizen's uh, a call or what have you, but something went wrong. Uh, uh, he was drunk. We don't deny that, but we, we did find out that he was still grieving the loss of his mother. He was in town. Why was he in town? Because he wanted to be there for his daughter's birthday, and he's dealing with all this stuff, and he's being antagonized by the police, even though he's trying to be courteous. That's just too much for one man to carry on his shoulders. And then we had to watch him being shot down viciously like he's a menacing Do Do Doberman pincher. We saw two officers hunt him down like he was a slave that was run off of Massa's plantation. And we saw two officers take his life ruthlessly. And one officer, when he arrived on the scene, he kicked his body, his lifeless body. The other stepped on him. And then one actually had the gall to say that we got him as if he was some runaway slave. That's just too much pressure for one person to bear. And, and maybe that's some of the pressure we're bearing as African-American men, that it's too much for our shoulders. And I already know some of my white Christian evangelical brothers, 
I can hear what you're thinking if you're watching and you're asking the question, well, Pastor, he did have a criminal record. I know you want to raise that because anytime there's an issue that happens with the police, the first thing you want to do is criminalize somebody as if somehow because a person has a criminal record, they ought to be judge, jury, and executioner when in fact we live in a free society and everyone has a right to a fair trial and jury. So I already know what you're saying. And here's my question because that's not even my question. My question is, where did we get to the place in our Christian faith where it became convenient to kick somebody when they're down? Where did we come to a place as people of God that somehow the people who need our compassion, we give them criticism and we dog them? Need, need I remind you that when Nehemiah got the word that brothers were struggling in the hood, he didn't criticize them. He didn't criminalize them. He didn't ask if they had a criminal record. No, he quit his cushy job and he went back to Jerusalem and he helped build up a nation that was struggling in the hood. Where did we get the idea that somehow it's convenient to kick people when they're down? Have we forgotten the word? words of the Apostle Peter when he preached that first sermon at Antioch in which he talked about Jesus that when he came to this earth he came doing good. He didn't come criminalizing people. He didn't come condemning people but he came to lift up people and do good. Where did we get to the place where it has become convenient to kick people when they're down? Matter of fact, I'm thinking about my church history. Have we come to the place that we've forgotten about how the early church in the second and in the third century when there were crazy plagues, the Antonian plague and the plague of Cyprian, and in those days they weren't arguing about whether or not they can worship. They weren't fighting with the government as to whether they can gather, but instead they got involved in the lives of those who were suffering from the plague. They got involved to try to help those who were doctoring and nursing and ministering to those who were sick that many times to the detriment of themselves and many of them lost their lives in the name of Jesus because they tried to help Christians and non-Christians. Where did we get to the place where we think it's convenient to kick people when they are down. Have we forgotten that when God had an opportunity to judge the entire world, but he said no, he sent Jesus to be the answer to our ills. Where did we get to the place where it's convenient to kick people when they're down. And that's why I'm convinced that too many of my white brothers, white Christian evangelicals and white brothers and sisters have this idea that if Jesus were living today and if he were put on trial for crucifixion, that the, the basic narrative would be, well, he must have done something wrong. He must have been a criminal. That's the only reason why he was arrested. That's why they had to beat him up, because he was resisting arrest. Crucify him. Crucify him. And I stop by to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not about destruction, but it is about life. God should have given us death but he gave us life. And if God didn't kick you when you were down, why are you so quick to kick somebody when they're down? That's too much for anybody's shoulders to bear. And that's why I'm excited about this text. Because in spite of all that we have to go through, the good news is God has big shoulders that enables us to get through the difficulty, that in this relationship with Paul and Timothy, we see how God can supernaturally and providentially provide the big shoulders that come from God, but also comes from the people who are around us. Matter of fact, my premise today that I want to lay out to you is that God does this. God uses our greatest rejection to set us up for the greatest redirection toward the big shoulders. In other words, the very thing that you think was about to take you out, God can set you up and use it to help you and lift you up. That in the midst of our difficulty, God has the big shoulders for every father to be a father. And then God has people sovereignly and providentially placed in such a way that they can also shoulder the difficulty that we can be the fathers that God called us to be. And so right here, I want to plug the old African proverb because it fits big time. 
It takes a village to raise a child. And that's true for all of us. Because the truth is, even if you had a father in your life or you didn't have a father in your life, the truth is you had somebody who influenced and shaped you and helped you be the person you were. And so for me, I'm gratefully thankful for my father who was big shoulders in my life. Clavin Autry Jr., I'm thankful for you because you are the one that were my big shoulders. You're the best father any son could possibly have. Matter of fact, to this day, I'm 58 years old, but when I call my dad, I still lean into your big shoulders. I couldn't have made it without your big shoulders. But if it truly takes a village to raise a child, then I've also had some other big shoulders in my life. I'm grateful for my late uncle, Uncle William Warren Thomas Sr., who had big shoulders for me. I'm grateful for my late uncle, Taz Kimbrough, for the big shoulders he provided for me. I'm grateful for my uncle, who pastors in Mobile, Alabama, Pastor Fred Autry, who also lent his big shoulders for me. And I can call the row from, from many of them, from, from, from one to the other, who served as big shoulders in my life and helped form and shape me into the man that I am today. And all I'm simply trying to say, for all the the fathers and all the men and all the women God has his big shoulders but he always has individuals that help shape us into the people that we can be and so that's my word today I just wanted to say thank you for being that father thank you for many of you for being father figures thank you for being the coach thank you for being the teacher thank you for being the uncle Thank you for being the surrogate. Thank you to all the men that stepped up and helped be this great village that raises us. And so I want to just share three very quick thank yous because of your support for us as fathers that we wouldn't be what we are today if it wasn't for you in our lives. Number one, here's the first one. I want to thank all the dads for just believing in us. I just want to thank you for believing in us. That's what I see in this text when Paul talks about uh, the word that he tells Timothy here, that he gives him this command and entrusts him in verse 18, he wants to remind him that when he entrusts him with this word, it's in accordance with the prophecies that were spoken over him so that he would continue to fight the good fight. Because the truth is, Timothy was in a church in which he was catching H-E-L-L, -L, and he was ready to throw in the towel. But, Tim, but, but, Tim, but Paul tells Timothy, look, I believe in you. I know God has a calling on your life. I know it's difficult, and I know you're ready to quit, but I know what God has done in your life. I know what was spoken over your life. I've seen you preach. I've seen you teach. I've seen your vision. I've seen the discipleship. I've seen your commitment to the Lord, and I've seen your commitment to the ministry. Don't throw in the towel because I believe in you. And so to all the fathers, we thank you so much for believing in us, when we didn't even believe in ourselves. You knew exactly what to say. You were there for us. You were there lifting us up. And the truth is, we wouldn't have made it if it hadn't have been for your affirmation and your confidence in us. In other words, what I'm trying to say today, y'all, is that when you believe in us, fathers, it helps cleanse the spirit on the inside. We feel good about ourselves. Every time you share how much you believe in us. And so James Baldwin said it like this, and I think it makes the point. It took many years of vomiting up all the filth I'd been taught about myself and half believed before I was able to walk on the earth as though I had a right to be here. And as fathers, that's what you all have done. That many times we have been sold some false narratives about ourselves. We've been told we were less than. We've been told that we didn't fit. We've been told we're not good enough. We've been told that we were not pretty enough or not handsome enough or we didn't have the skill. But because of you, you were able to, to counter the false narratives and the indoctrination that got in our soul. You helped us to vomit all that stuff by speaking the right narratives in our lives and telling us how much you believe in us. And so I want to encourage you that even as adults, we still need that. One study suggests that children 
They really, really do well when parents constantly remind them over and over again how much they believe in them. It gives them stability and it gives them confidence. Well, I'm going to say this. Not only do the children need it, but the adults need it too. (laughs) That we who are grown and even we still have our parents or we have father figures in our lives, we need you to tell us you're proud of us. We need you to tell us that you're rooting for us. We need you to remind us that we're still your prince or, we're, or for our daughters to know that, you, that they are your princesses. We need to know that we can make it. We need you to believe in us. And when you do that, it enables us to keep on fighting. It cleanses our spirit and we're clear on who we are and we're able to keep fighting. And so number one, we thank you for believing us in us. Number two, we thank you for working with us. Oh, that's in the text as well. Matter of fact, I put here 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, in which Paul calls Timothy his brother. But then here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, he calls him a son. And it speaks to the complex relationship that Paul had to deal with when he dealt with Timothy. He started off as a son in the faith. Then he became a co-laborer. Then he became a co-partner in the faith. And then Timothy accepted his call into the ministry. And then he became a a son in the ministry. And so all these different levels of relationships, Paul was able to navigate all the complexities of their relationship and give Timothy the training and the support he needed as he moved to maturation as as a man and as a minister. And for fathers, I want to thank you Because we live in a time in which the family is very complex. (laughs) So much so for no such thing as a traditional family too much anymore today. But family is complex and it comes with so many complexities and different uh, variations. And yet, in spite of that, you've hung in there and you've had to play so many roles, whether it's stepfather or father or dealing with the wife or the mother and all the complexities and and blended families, and all this stuff that comes with it, and it becomes almost mind-boggling, but somehow you've trusted God, and you've hung in there, and you've stayed with it. And so for you, we say thank you in spite of all the complexities that come with relationships. You hung on in there. And so I'm reminded of a time when I was youth pastor at Friendship West. I must have been about 29 or 30, back when dinosaurs walked and roamed along the the earth. (laughs) I was youth pastor at Friendship West, and I never shall forget, I never shall forget this for as long as I live. Had a family bring a young man to me, to my office, and they were having some educational problems with him, and they wanted to know what was the best way to help him take advantage of his education. He He was fighting what the parents wanted, and they brought him to me. Now, who showed up is what surprised me. Wasn't just mommy and daddy, and mommy and daddy did show up, but mama showed up with her boyfriend, And daddy showed up with his new wife. And so I'm thinking, I'm 29, I'm 30 years old. My son, my oldest son, he's about one at this time. My youngest son, he's not even here yet. And I'm saying to the Lord, what in the world could I possibly share with this family? I'm about 30 years old. They're probably in their late 30s, their early 40s. And they want me to give some advice in this complex situation in which how to deal with their differences in educating this child. And what blew my mind about the whole situation was how cordial everybody was to each other, how respectful, uh, how courteous they were to each other. It wasn't like the mama had an issue with the new wife. It wasn't like the new wife had an issue with the mama. I said, I must be in the twilight zone. You mean to tell me two sisters in the same room that used to go with the same two and they not mad at each other? I said, oh my God, heaven has come to earth. I, had, I couldn't believe it. But the boyfriend didn't have an issue with the, with the father and the father didn't have an issue with the boy, the boy with the boyfriend. And so they started asking me questions and they were kind of playing it off like this is how all families roll. And I said, hold up. Stop. Stop acting like this is normal. Because you know this is not normal. And of course, they laughed when I stopped them. And I said, no, seriously. I said, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm only 30 years old. I've seen this a couple of times. And really, it, it demonstrates where we're headed as a country. And some of us don't want to admit it. But what you all are doing to have the respect and the peace and a sense of camaraderie here, how did y'all get to this place? And before I can even finish my question, the father spoke up and said, you know what? I'm not going to tell you it was easy to get here. We had our differences. 
and we had to work through them. He said, but at the end of the day, all of us made an agreement that we had to put aside old wounds. We had to put aside old differences. We had to put the past in the past because it ain't about us. We had our time. This is our son's time. And that's my word to all the fathers, the mothers, and all the stuff and complexities that come with family. Listen, we got to learn to work together. You had your chance when you were younger. You had your romantic days. Now it comes a time. It's not about what happened in the past. It's not about what didn't happen for you. It's about the kids. And we've got to be careful, fathers and moms, because I've discovered one thing about God. If I focus too much on the wrong thing, God can't do the right thing on my behalf. If I keep focusing on that which is bad, don't you know God can't bring what is good in my life. And so I saw something that kind of brought this thing to close. I saw something this week and it really blessed my heart. I saw a wonderful young lady. She was a college student at a university. Uh, she was a white young lady and she was a music major and she wanted to make a contribution to the Black Lives Matter protest and all that was going on. And her way of doing it was to sing the national anthem. And by singing the national anthem, that was her way of saying to Black Lives Matter protesters that I hope and pray that this anthem will be as precious to you as it is to me. I hope and pray that you will one day feel your life matter as much as my life already does matter because your life should matter as much as my life matters in this country. And so she started singing and it was very clear that she was a music major because she could flat out sing. And about halfway through the national anthem, there was a brother that passed by her, and he was an opera major, and he also could sing. And he was taken aback by the fact that she was singing the national anthem. So he, he asked the people who were filming, can I join her and help her finish that? They said, go right ahead. And so without her even recognizing, he joined her in singing the national anthem and what was eventually a solo became a duet. And when they began to harmonize, it was one of the most beautiful renditions of the national anthem that I had ever heard so much so when they came to the end, I'm in my house by myself. I'm thinking I'm in a crowd. I stood up and started clapping, y'all. Of course, I look stupid standing in my house all by myself. But it was a word for me. In that, if we can learn to sing together and harmonize together, don't you know America will be a better place? That's the same thing for families. If fathers and mothers can learn to harmonize together, don't you know it will be a whole lot better for the children if we can all sing in unison? Yes, thank you, fathers for working with us. I know it's not always easy, but I thank you. Here's my last one, and I'm out of here. Thank you for holding on to us. That's my word in here, because if it wasn't for you holding on to us, a lot of us would not have make it, made it. And so here in Paul's final letter to Timothy, many believe that he is on death row and he's about to lose his life. And so there's a sense that this letter is very, very personal to Paul. And he's kind of reaching out and he's holding on to Timothy and he's pouring into him, trying to pour every last lesson and teaching and encouragement into his life because he knows he's about to lose his life. And, 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 and because of that, because he's pouring into Timothy, God is pouring into him even though he's about to face the ultimate. And there's a confidence that rises up in Paul that even though he's about to lose his life, he knows God is holding on to him. So as he holds on to Timothy, he, he senses the presence of God holding on to him. And that's my word to all the, the fathers that are watching. When you hold on to your children, and even though the load may get a little bit heavy for your shoulders, don't you know that's when your father in heaven will hold on to you tighter. The tighter you hold on to us and the tighter you hold on to your children, that's when you'll sense the power and the presence of God holding on to you in the midst of your difficulty. In other words, no matter what you're going through, God always has his eye on you. And so let me close with this and I'm done. Here it is. This is to my dad. 
Happy Father's Day. I'm pastor. I get to do that. And so I'm going to do that. God bless you. I love you too. But this is for my dad. You probably don't even remember this, dad. But years ago, I must have been about second grade. And you kind of gave me uh, the fifth degree and said I had gotten into quite a bit of fights. And I was a little bit mischievous at school. And you kind of told me, okay, now if you get in another fight, me and you, it's going to be it's going to be on like neck bones. And I believed you. I believed you. But I was too. I was only in the second grade and, and really going into the third grade. And I kind of couldn't keep my hands to myself and I kept getting in trouble. I'd like to say that I obeyed my dad, but I didn't. But I got into another fight. And so for whatever reason that day, my dad picked me up. You picked me up, dad. And I got into the truck with you, your truck from business. And you you said hello. And I said hello. You asked how my day was going. Did I have a good day? And I said, yes. And, 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 and uh, you said, you're sure? And I didn't say anything. I said, yeah, I had a great day. And, and I just left it at that. And when you left it at that, I said, oh, I must have gotten away with this. Because I know the school, normally, when you get into a fight and get in trouble, the first thing they do is call your parents. So I thought I was good. I got home. I expected mom to say something to me. Mom didn't say anything. How was your day? Did you do your homework? I said, yeah, I did my homework. Well, we getting ready to go out to dinner. We went out to dinner that night, had a wonderful time, came home. I said, shoot, I'm in the clear. And so I got ready to go to bed, and then you came up to me and said, son, when were you going to tell me about that fight you got into today? And I said, I don't know if you remember, I said, how did you know I had gotten in a fight? And at the time when you asked me that, Marvin Gaye's hit song was number one. Oh, I heard it through the grapevine. So when I asked you that question, I said, Dad, how did you know? I didn't tell you. This was the first words out of your mouth. You said, oh, I heard it through the grapevine. And you started laughing, and Mom started laughing. So I figured, I said, well, if Mom is laughing and Dad is laughing, I might as well join in and laugh. That might save me a butt whooping. So I just really started laughing. Oh, that is so funny. <laughs> but then afterwards, I would discover you had been up to school that day. That's why you picked me up. And actually, you told me afterwards, you didn't spank me, but you told me, son, you said, son, and I never shall forget it. You said, don't you know, as your father, I always have my eye on you. You never know when I'm going to show up. You never know if I'm watching you. And so I want you to live like you know your daddy's always watching you. And when I first heard that, there was sometimes I'd be at school, I'd be looking around. Because I knew I was doing something I had no business doing, and I was looking for you. And it used to bother me. But as I got older, I began to be thankful that God had given me a father who always had his eye on me. And that's my word to all the fathers today, that you have a heavenly father that no matter what difficulty and challenge you may be going through, you've got a father that's always watching over you. Is there anybody watching that knows that we have a father? He's got his eye on you. If his eye is on the sparrow, then I know he watches over me. God is always on our side. Hold on, fathers. Happy Father's Day. God will give you the big shoulder to be the father he called you to be. God bless you. May God keep you. And that's the word I believe God has given to us today, fathers. That's the word I believe God has for us, for those who have the opportunity to celebrate the fathers in our lives. That's the word I believe God has given to us for those who, let's just, let's just say Father's Day is a little bit difficult. It's a little bit complex. That somehow, some way, God has a way of giving us the big shoulders we need to make it or providing the big shoulders in our life to make it to where we are. Be honest. You wouldn't be who you are if it wasn't for some father figure or your father in your life. And in those moments, you can say thank you. You can be appreciative for all that God has done for you. If you got a father, celebrate him. Celebrate him big time. If you've had father figures, celebrate him. But more importantly, you always got God your father in your life. And in everything, in all times, you can be thankful for the father that he is in your life. And he will be the big shoulder for you. That is the Christian faith, my brother. That is the Christian faith, my sister. And if you're watching today, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. 
That's what it means to be a Christian. He gathers all of us together in this family, the family of God. It's a universal family. Christians all around the world, we call God our Father. And that when Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago for your sins and mine, he paid the penalty that you might be a part of God's family, and that you may call God your Father. And maybe this Father's Day, that's the word that God wants you to get. There's some eternal big shoulders that God wants you to rest on. And if you're here today, I want to give you an opportunity. If you're watching today, I should say, I want to give you the opportunity to trust this Christ that you may be part of God's uh, God's family and experience the big shoulders of of the eternal Father that we worship and that we serve. On the slide, there's an invitational prayer. If you've never trusted Christ, the gospel's simple. Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. And the Bible teaches if you believe that, he'll save you. I want to lead you through that. If you want to be a part of the family of God, your Father in heaven surely wants, to, wants you to be a part of the family of God. But he's not going to force you. He's not going to make you do anything you don't want to do. He wants you to trust him by faith. So in just a moment, we're going to do that. I'm going to lead you through that prayer. And if you pray that with me, believing, God will save you. Come on, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we bless you and thank you again for the fact that you're a God that provides big shoulders for us. We thank you for that and all that you give to us. And somebody's watching me right now, Lord. They, they don't have a relationship with you. I know they've had some father challenges or maybe they've had wonderful fathers in their life, but deep down inside, they know they need a heavenly father. They know they need an eternal father. So Lord, by your spirit, would you touch? Would you touch and open someone's heart right now to receive you and to be a part of the family of God? If that's you, God is talking to you. He's in your pl- He's in your home. He's in your place. That's God's spirit touching your heart. And this is your opportunity to become a part of God's family. Would you do that today? It's very simple. Simply repeat this prayer after me. If you repeat it believing, God will save you. It's very simple. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died and rose for my sins. Thank you for forgiveness. I accept you as my Savior and my Lord to make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. It's that simple. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, if you prayed that, listen, the angels in heaven are throwing a party because you've been made a part of God's family. God is your Father. You have access to his big shoulders, and he surely wants to walk with you. We'd love to share with you and help you on your journey. That's why the church exists. We're the local family of believers, and we surely want to be those spiritual shoulders that help you in your walk with God. If you've trusted Christ for the first time, would you email us at life at ccrichardson.org? Would you do that? Just just put in the email that you're trusting Christ and you want to know the next steps and how you can grow in your faith. We want to help you with that. We're not trying to embarrass you. We surely want you to experience the all that God has for your life. Maybe you're watching and you know you're a Christian and but you're not connected to a local family. If God is your father, don't you know God wants you in a family? You've been watching us for a couple of weeks. You've been watching us for maybe even a couple of months. And some of you, you've been visiting us for a while before this whole COVID. And God is saying, come on, make it official. Be a part of the fellowship. I got a plan for you. As my mentor would say, if it's wrong to be outside of the church, you know it's right to be a part of God's family. So why don't you go ahead and make it, make this official. Life at ccrichardson.org. We'll share with you the steps to become a part of this fellowship. Be a part of what God is doing in the earth. It truly takes a community to make a difference. We need you. Come on and join us. To all of our guests, we know God is doing something in your life. Uh, it, there's a, there's a, a link to connect with us in the description box right there, whether on Facebook or YouTube. If you click on that and fill it out, we got a gift we want to send you. It only takes a minute. We're not trying to get your information like some of these other uh, social media places. We simply want to minister to you. We know God is up to something in your life. Would you let us do that? Connect with us today, and we surely would love to send you a gift, and we surely would like to share with you the next steps of what God is doing in your life. God bless you. May God keep you to all the fathers. Happy Father's Day. I hope today is a wonderful day for you, but I hope it extends on throughout the year that 
you know that God empowers you with the big shoulder to lead your family and to be all that God wants you to be. Let's get the benediction and we're going to get on out of here. You are the light of the world, so go fathers, go family, go together, harmonize, and sing the same song so you can create better families for everybody. Know that, fathers, God is broadening your big shoulders that you may be the leader and carry family in a way that honors God and blesses your family, blesses your children bless his people. We thank you. We love you. We trust the Lord for all that he'll do in your life. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Love you. I'll see you next week.